Welcome to this online worship service from St. Andrew's Amersburg. Let us begin today with our call to worship, which comes from Psalm 105. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known his accomplishments among the nations. Sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wonderful acts, glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and the strength he gives. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wonders he has done, his miracles and the judgments he has uttered. He remembers his covenant forever, the promise he made for a thousand generations. He is the Lord our God. Praise the Lord. Our opening hymn is Eternal Father, Strong to Save. Let us pray. Gracious God, we come to you once again to offer you praise and thanksgiving for your unfailing love and faithfulness to the whole world, shown most clearly through your Son, Jesus Christ. Grant us grace to worship you this and every day in spirit and in truth. Through the power of your Holy Spirit, open our eyes to recognize you among us, each in our own homes and in the circles in which we live and move. Surprising and mysterious God, you come to us when we least expect it, calling us out of our routines and our plans, inviting us to follow Christ on a great journey of faith. We praise you for the many ways you comfort and guide us. In our moments of fear, you speak to us with words of reassurance. In our moments of doubt, you reach out your hand to save us. In our moments of turmoil, you bring calm to the storm. Give us courage to step out in faith to meet you and confidence to follow where you lead. For you are our God and we are your people, called by your name. We place our trust in you this day and every day and worship you as our creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Amen. Let us continue with a prayer of confession. Merciful and patient God, even though we have been touched by your saving grace, 
we confess that we still live in fear and doubt. You call us to step out in faith, to place our lives in your hands, and to wholeheartedly commit to following you. We confess that we find this difficult to do. It's not always easy to follow where you lead, to turn away from our own personal wants and desires, to let go of our safety nets and to trust in your provision and leading. Forgive us when we doubt you, God. Increase our faith. Open our eyes to see past our own interests and concern to your broader vision for us and for our world. In the authority of Jesus we pray. Amen. Hear these words of assurance from Paul's letter to the Romans. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God, and it is by confessing with your mouth that you are saved. For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So be at peace. Our sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. The first reading this morning is from the book of Job, chapter 9, verses 1 to 10 and 32 and 33. Then Job replied, Indeed, I know that this is true, but how can mere mortals prove their innocence before God? Though they wished to dispute with him, they could not answer him one time out of a thousand. His wisdom is profound. His power is vast. Who has resisted him and come out unscathed? He moves mountains without their knowing it and overturns them in his anger. He shakes the earth from its place and makes its pillars tremble. He speaks to the sun and it does not shine. He seals off the light of the stars. He alone stretches out the heavens and treads on the waves of the sea. He is the maker of the bear and Orion, the Pelides and the constellations of the south. He performs wonders that cannot be fathomed, miracles that cannot be counted. He is not a mere mortal like me that I might answer him, that we might confront each other in court. If only there were someone to mediate between us, someone to bring us together. Our second reading is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 43, verses 1 to 3. But now, this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew, chapter 14, verses 22 to 33. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone. And the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking 
on the lake. And when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Alwyn, for bringing our scriptures to life for us today. Our next hymn is Give to the Winds Thy Fears. Last week, we considered the credibility-stretching account of the feeding of the 5,000, where Jesus miraculously feeds the multitude with just five loaves and two fish. This week's reading is another mind-bender. Jesus walks on the stormy waters of the Sea of Galilee, then invites Peter to join him, and later, when Jesus climbs aboard the boat, the storm is stilled. What are we to make of all this? This is one of those so-called nature miracles that challenges a physicist like me. An individual healing is easier to accept than something as dramatic as this. It's problematic because, in essence, the miracle is one of physics, not biology. Skeptics have proposed an optical illusion to explain what happened. If that were the case, however, it can only be assumed that the disciples would have quickly discovered their error and this story would not have been preserved for posterity. I think instead of getting bogged down with the question, did it happen, and if so, how, it's better to ask, what does it all mean? In other words, how would this story have been understood by the Jews of the day? As we saw with the feeding of the 5,000, that event pointed to someone greater than Moses being here. So perhaps we can expect this account of Jesus walking on the water to also reveal something about his identity. 
Matthew starts by Jesus telling the disciples to go ahead of him by boat to the other side of the lake. Jesus then went up the mountainside by himself to pray alone. After Matthew's dramatic account of the feeding of the multitude, this has echoes of Moses going up the mountain to meet with God. In the meantime, the boat containing the disciples was some considerable distance from the land, and it was, we're told, nighttime. Moreover, they were experiencing a storm and were struggling against a headwind, and the boat was taking a beating. However, unlike the earlier and similar story where Jesus reportedly calmed a storm, there's no mention here that the disciples were afraid that they would drown. We're then told that somewhere between 3 and 6 a.m., Jesus came walking to them on the lake. What's going on? Is it a trickster? A magician? An evil spirit? Of course they know that people don't walk on water, and so they rationalise what they saw as being a ghost, a spirit from the dead, and they were terrified. Let's pause and remember that in that culture, the unpredictable turbulent sea symbolised the embodiment of all that was evil. The psalmist and the writers of Job and Proverbs speak of the stormy sea and its monsters as dark powers that threaten the goodness of God's created order. Only God can confine chaos. That is made clear in the opening lines of Genesis 1. And for the Jews, this was vividly demonstrated in the crossing of the Red Sea at the time of Moses, and later when Joshua led the people through the River Jordan when entering the Promised Land. This imagery is also referenced in the end of the book of Revelation, where the new heaven and earth is described as no longer having a sea, signifying that evil and chaos will be eradicated. But for now, chaos and order coexist in tension, one that is destructive, as in hurricanes and fires, and yet, ironically, creative too. As I mentioned a moment, ago, a moment ago, the Jews understood that God alone could tame or limit the powers of the sea. We heard earlier in our reading from Job, he alone treads on the waves of the sea. While we think of walking on the water as defying gravity, first century Jewish readers would see Jesus as exercising a prerogative that belongs to God alone. Jesus then speaks to his disciples, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Those words, it is I, are the equivalent of the divine I am that God spoke to Moses from the burning bush. In walking on the water, Jesus does what only God can do, and now he speaks words that Jews associated with God himself. We need to pause take a deep breath and absorb all of this. These mysterious actions and words link Jesus with God, the liberator and redeemer of Israel, who is at the same time the creator of the world and the victor over chaos. Note, this need not be seen as a publicity stunt that commanded allegiance. No one else was there except his disciples and Jesus already had their loyalty. Rather, this was an unforgettable teaching moment that revealed to the disciples exactly who it was that they were following. This is an epiphany, a revelation, and we should see this incident in the same light as a transfiguration that Matthew later reports in chapter 17. Matthew is the only Gospel writer who presents the subsequent dialogue between Jesus and Peter and his walking on the water. I want to spend the rest of this sermon exploring that aspect. Peter says, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. 
It's a bold, perhaps impetuous thing to ask. Yet Peter knows that this is not something he can do on his own initiative. Jesus must empower him to do so. Whatever God has endowed Messiah Jesus, Jesus shares it with Peter and invites him to come towards him on the water. And we're told Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water and came toward Jesus. This act of obedience takes great faith and courage. Let's not overlook or belittle that fact by what happens next. Bonhoeffer writes, Peter had to leave the ship and risk his life on the sea in order to learn his own weaknesses and the almighty power of his Lord. If Peter had not taken the risk, he would have never learned the meaning of faith. I'll talk more about the meaning of faith shortly. As Peter walks, he gets distracted by the wind and so takes his eyes off Jesus. His faith quickly turned into fear, and he begins to sink. He cries out, Lord, save me! And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him. Jesus then gently rebukes Peter. You of little faith, why did you doubt? Such criticism must not overlook the fact that Peter earlier obeyed the command of Jesus to come. And note that the Greek word for doubt here implies vacillating back and forth rather than habitual scepticism. We could therefore see this as a story about a faithful follower of Jesus who becomes overwhelmed by circumstances around them and so lose their nerve. Faith mixed with fear and doubt is where many Christians find themselves. Take heart. Jesus can still work with faltering faith. We read in the book of Acts about the man of faith that Peter became. Walking by faith involves learning to live with uncertainty and learning to remain focused on Jesus rather than the towering problems that threaten to engulf us or the critical opinions of others. And that learning will inevitably have its ups and downs. We're human. I often say that the line between faith and foolishness is thin, and sometimes we may wonder which side we're on. Now, that phrase, you of little faith, could also be translated, you of little trust. And I think that makes better sense in this context. Faith is much more than belief. It's not enough to say, I believe in God, or to simply recite the creeds. The real question is, do we trust God? As Curtis Holson puts it, the opposite of faith is not doubt, but distrust. Faith involves trust. And trust involves risk, and trust is demonstrated by action or obedience. We see that in Peter getting out of the relative security of the boat and taking those first steps toward Jesus. And the notion that faith involves trust, risk and action describes all human relationships because faith is relational or personal. Peter trusted Jesus. Do we trust God? Dare we as individuals and as a church trust God to the point that we risk all and being aware of the dangers still act? Will we, like Peter, leave the security of our boats and courageously follow the invitation of Jesus to come? William Willimon summarises it like this. If Peter had not ventured forth and not obeyed the call to walk on the water, then Peter would never have had this great opportunity for recognition of Jesus and of being rescued by Jesus. He continues, 
I wonder if too many of us are merely splashing about in the safe shallows and therefore have too few opportunities to test and deepen our faith. This story implies that if you want to be close to Jesus, you have to venture forth out on risk and you have to prove his promises through trusting his promises, through risk and venture. Matthew concludes, when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down, and then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly you are the Son of God. The wind dying down reverts back to that earlier epiphany, and Jesus being witnessed as the master of the winds and the waves. And through this experience, the disciples come to recognize that Jesus is the Son of God and they worship him. That act in itself would be blasphemous to devout Jews. The title Son of God means belonging to God and is synonymous with Messiah or God's chosen one. It's only through the turbulent experiences that arise along the journey of faith that we can truly know that Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. In these uncertain times, and in whatever you are personally facing this coming week, may we hear the words of Jesus. Have courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. Amen. Our next song is He Will Hold Me Fast.
Let us pray. Loving God, help us through this story to get a larger sense of who Jesus is and how he reveals you to the world. You invite us to yourself. Help us to have the courage to respond to that risky call, to trust you, and to demonstrate that trust by moving towards you. We thank you that you come to us in the storms of life. Help us to remember the words of Jesus. Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid when the wind is strong and the waves are high. When our dreams come to nothing and we wonder what lies ahead. When those we love disappoint us or hurt us deeply. When we've lost all hope and don't know where to turn. And when our faith is stretched to the breaking point and we doubt your love for us. Help us to absorb again your reassuring words through the prophet Isaiah, born out of suffering. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Saviour. Gracious God, whatever situations we are facing, we come to you in faith, hope and love, trusting in you regardless of what happens next. Lord, we pray for those who are facing tragedy through fire and flooding, collapsed buildings and other catastrophes. May the aid they need come swiftly, we pray. We also pray for those who are ill or grieving or facing life-changing challenges. We pray especially for Ralph, Roger, Bob Hawkins, Bob Rogers, Kathleen and Graham. We pray for all these people, along with their caregivers and others known to us, in a moment of silence. Lord, hear our prayer. We ask your healing touch for Ralph, that the doctors will stabilize his condition and that the medications he receives will be effective. The psalmist says, Be still and know that I am God. Give to those whom we have prayed for and for ourselves peace and hope in our storms and a reassurance that you are there too. Strengthen our hearts for the challenges we face each day. God of hope, you do challenge us. You come to us in the midst of trouble and invite us to stand for justice and to work for truth. We pray for all those crying out for fair treatment, working against racism and discrimination, telling painful stories of their lives. Open our hearts and understandings and motivate us to act for change. And we pray for those who resist such stories of injustice and defend inequality and privilege. May your spirit open minds and soften hearts to the truths they deny and show them new possibilities for relationships that bridge divides. Equip us to reach out in every way we can to embody your love in our words and actions. Faithful God, we place our trust in you and in your purposes. Answer our prayers according to your wisdom and mercy. We offer them humbly in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Our closing hymn is Great is Thy Faithfulness. Jesus calls us to leave the safety of our boats and to walk towards him in faith, joining him in the work that he is already doing in our world. He calls us to trust him and to follow where he is leading, even if what he calls us to do seems risky or impossible. So let's go from here with courage, trusting in God's presence and power and eager to do his will. And may the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among you and within you, wherever you find yourself this week. Amen. <laughs>